We live in the Anthropocene, a term that describes the epoch in which humans have a significant impact over the planet and driving a rapidly evolving socio-environmental crisis. Cities are considered at the core of increased pressures over nature. By 2030, as much as two-thirds of the world's population will be living in urban areas. For this reason, we need to formulate policies that help keep human impact over nature the smallest possible. While human behavior affects nature, nature influences humans too. Policymakers increasingly understand the strong connection between nature and society and specifically use nature in cities as a tool to increase quality of life. Urban gardens, parks, or green facades deliver multiple benefits, help improving air, water, and soil contribute to local food production, and may even deliver economic revenues through, for example, a growing tourism and real estate sector. All these benefits are mostly expressed monetarily. Nature becomes a part of the economic market. Putting a value on nature is per se not bad. It helps to prioritize specific policies over others. However, values expressed should be mirroring different ways of connecting with nature. Until now, most political decisions about nature have nonetheless focused on two rather narrow value categories. The instrumental value of nature portrays nature as an instrument to increase human well-being. Instrumental values draw dominantly on monetary indicators and promote economic growth. For example, the planting of trees in cities helps reduce CO2 levels in the atmosphere, which mitigates climate change while improving human health. This reduces public health costs and spendings. The intrinsic value of nature they are about the inherent worth of nature, no matter if we humans value nature or not. Intrinsic values refer to the moral notion of why we want to conserve nature, but they are difficult to measure given their abstract nature. They can be found in framings of conservation and restoration projects in early ecological movements. While these two value categories dominate environmental decision-making, they are simplified perspectives of nature's value. Especially the prioritization of instrumental value has been criticized for replicating colonialist understandings of the world because it treats nature as integral part of economic neoliberal thinking. People around the globe are different and hence their perspectives on what nature is and what it may bring to humans differ consequently. For example, indigenous communities may value nature for its sacredness and spirituality, elements that Western framings of nature do not account for. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services calls therefore to include a third values category. Relational values, People value meaningful relationships with respect to nature and their contributions to people's individual and collective well-being. These values are expressed through, for example, sentiments of care, stewardship, place attachment, and sense of belonging, and the many emotional attachments people retrieve from experiences in and with nature. We may have developed a deep emotional bond to green spaces from our childhood while walking the dog or sharing time with family and friends. These values are difficult to measure in economic terms, but necessary as they are the base for a community and deeper connection with the natural environment and with people through nature. So, why relational values in urban planning? Relational values of nature can be an important motivation for urban planners to prioritize non-economic contributions of nature to human well-being. Emphasizing the strong emotional ties of residents with local landscapes can thus serve as a leverage for taking collective and individual action for the environment. But how can we integrate relational values in urban planning when discourses on the ground are influenced mostly by instrumental and intrinsic values? We zoom into the 250,000 resident city of Vitoria Gastes, situated in the north of Spain, 
capital of the Basque country. Being a mid-sized city, Vitoria Gasteiz has often been in the shadow of green international metropoles, such as Vancouver, Copenhagen, or Barcelona. The international spotlight came with the prestigious European Green Capital Award in 2012, a campaign created by the European Union to promote urban sustainability policies. Being the 2012 winner city, Vitoria Gasteiz became an international flagship for long-term progressive environmental policymaking. The city's beginning of its green transformation dates back as far as to the 1980s. Early greening initiatives were mostly framed around intrinsic values to restore degraded green spaces. Turning quickly into highly appreciated neighborhood parks, urban nature was perceived as a social good with multiple benefits for the residents. Yet, looking at the city's environmental discourse nowadays, there is a dominantly instrumental language that tends to integrate only those environmental goals compatible with economic growth. How did envisioning urban nature shift from holistic understandings of nature towards an economic development project? To understand the shifting values of Vitoria Gasteiz's environmental planning, we travel a few decades back in time, namely when the city's economy shifted from agriculture to car manufacturer. For the most time being, Vitoria Gasteiz was a small 40,000 resident town living from agriculture. In the 1950s, tax incentives from the central government in Francoist Spain started a tremendous industrialization process around the car industry. In only two decades, the city's population nearly grew fourfold, and with that came a pressing need for housing. This rapid urban and industrial growth favored the encroachment of vacant land and triggered extensive land pollution. By the end of the Francoist dictatorship in the mid-1970s, the city had grown to 190,000 residents. This is when nature entered local discourse about urban development, mostly driven by José Ángel Cuerda. In 1979, Cuerda became Vitoria Gaste's first democratically elected mayor during the Spanish transition to democracy. He was, and still is, being known for his progressive and social vision of a city. But what exactly was so green about him? In 1986, Cuerda founded the Environmental Study Center, at first a training center for unemployed youth that soon turned into an influential municipality-led think tank. By creating the CEA, Vitoria Gasteiz had the unique structure of a municipality-owned research hub for only thinking about how to incorporate nature into the city. At that time, Vitoria Gasteiz experienced several floodings in the previously industrialized and urbanized areas. There was a pressing need to come up with environmental solutions. Opposing the then-ruling one-size-fits-all approach of pouring concrete, Vitoria Gaste's local environmental engineers instead fought for the slow and natural restoration of degraded green spaces. In the early 1990s, the CEA Center could start with the recovery of the Salburua wetlands and surrounding parks. These interventions helped successfully reducing the floodings. Salburua Park is nowadays very well known, in and outside the city boundaries, receiving several awards for its high biodiversity. Zooming out to the global scale to the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, one concept took up speed and became core element of international policymaking, sustainability. This discourse reached Vitoria Gasteiz City Hall, and in 1995, it was the first Spanish city signing on to the Alborg Charter of European Sustainable Cities and Towns that formally embedded sustainability in Europe. Sustainability became part of the local urban DNA, long before other cities even started talking about it. In 1999, after 20 years being mayor of Vitoria Gasteiz, Cuerda left his office, at first followed by the Spanish Conservative People's Party and in 2007 by the Basque Country Center-Left Party. With this political change, the city's urban project shifted from small-scale interventions to envisioning the large metropolis common with many other Spanish cities during the real estate boom of the early 2000s. 
municipal land was offered cheaply to the real estate and construction sector, leading to re-urbanization projects whose pace and scale went far beyond the actual demand. Nonetheless, the continuation of Cuerda's pro-social green vision became an easy win-win situation for the new municipal government. Supporting green interventions turned into a form of a local economic asset, attracting international awards and funds. In 2007, the city implemented the Sustainable Mobility and Public Space Plan, proposing a citywide framework of restructuring public space. Bike, pedestrian, public transport, and recreational space should be prioritized over cars. Sounds familiar? Well, you may have heard of Barcelona's famous superblock model. Beyond this plan, innovative environmental policymaking stagnated in early 2000s. Yet, in 2012, Vitoria Gastes was awarded European Green Capital 2012 for its past high environmental standards and strong future commitments to sustainable development, following cities such as Stockholm and Hamburg. With this award, sustainability policies turned into a green branding campaign. Since then, the slogan, We Are the Green Capital, appears on nearly every advertising sign in the city. Nature turned into an inherent element of the local economic growth strategy, most and foremost promoted for its instrumental value. That again gained further recognition on the international level, leading to the 2019 United Nations Global Green Capital Award. And through signing on to the European mission of a 100 climate neutral and smart cities by 2030. But the question remains, how can we return from the economic reasoning towards a real social understanding of what the green city means? What can we learn from the early environmental thinking in the 1980s and early 1990s? We come back to the initial idea, integrating relational values in the local environmental discourse. In a recent study, we asked Vitoria Gaste's residents to rank statements expressing different values about nature. We found that residents in Vitoria Gastes have a much deeper and complex relationship with their natural environment. Their relationships with nature go beyond the instrumental framings that are dominating today's discourses in the city hall and beyond. The statements highest ranked by the study participants showed the deep individual connections with and care for nature or the impacts of urban nature on the collective identity and community. It is the place-based memories, connections, experiences that residents relate to and that create emotional bonds between citizens, planners, and their natural environment. That is, urban planners need to revalue nature for the city and the city for nature to face the challenges of the Anthropocene and resulting socio-environmental crisis.